that how many of the books about it and you know from novels to nonfiction were focusing on the men's stories because you know there are these titanic male figures like Alan Turing and believe me they deserve every drop of ink that's been written about them they're wonderful figures but at the same time I was started to wonder really what were the ladies of Bletchley Park doing and the thing that really made me think that was the fact that at its peak in 1945 you know, Bletchley Park employed 8,988 people, 6,757 of those were women. So that really made me wonder, okay, what were the ladies up to? And that honestly is probably one of the things that I ask myself almost anytime I become fascinated with something and start thinking about it as a book topic, it's what were the women doing? Because, you know, quite often you don't see the women in the broad strokes of history. You see them around the edges, you know, in the cracks, in the corners. And so the more I was reading about Bletchley, the more I, I, I really realized that I wanted to tell a story about what the women were doing in Bletchley. And, you know, it's, that's a that was a huge complicated story because, you know, with that many thousands of women, there are thousands of stories. I hope we see more books about the women of Bletchley Park because they were a wonderful crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me a lot too. I know that I think our eyes were opened even to like NASA, right? With hidden figures. And you realize that there's these women that are very often hidden figures all through history. So I love that you write about them. So tell me a little bit about your research process in this because I know it was extensive. I think honestly, this book was the most complicated I have ever researched. And really that is because um, there's been, you know, ironically, so much written about Bletchley Park. And it's ironic because, you know, everyone who worked there worked under the Official Secrets Act, which meant that for not only did they keep the secret of what they did during the war, and they were told, you know, you don't tell your, your parents, your friends, your family, your spouse, your children, no one. And they kept that secret, you know, which is incredible to us now because we live in the, the era of a 24 hour news cycle and people who update, you know, everything, including like what they're eating on, you know, social media, every single moment of the day, it feels like. But in these people, though, they were just handed one of the biggest secrets of the war, and they were told, you know, we'll just don't talk about it. And they didn't. But it did mean that uh, even though they did keep the secret that by the time that we're about the 70s rolled around and the 30 year period had passed, you did start to see um, more allowability as far as what was said about Bletchley. And that meant that a lot of people wrote memoirs and a lot of um, a lot of books and a lot of articles were written about, you know, the Enigma cipher and the Enigma machines, which they broke. And so there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And I felt like I read them all or I tried to. And I think so with this particular book, it was not just about the code breaking, which was difficult enough to research because I do not have a technical mathy mind, but I decided to write about something technical and mathy like code breaking. And all I can say is it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> so, which is really probably what a lot of us end up thinking when we write something and then we realize we actually have to learn it in order to write about it. Yeah, every so, book, every book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, so it's, I was not only reading, reading and researching the Enigma machines and the code breaking process, but it was also, you know, about the home front. It was about, you know, daily life in Britain during, uh, during the war. It was about the Blitz. It was about so many things. And really this became one of those books, I think that you know, it's like, I had so many fact checking things to make sure that I got right, that, you know, I still sort of live in terror that I something sneaked through, you know, we, we all have that dream. But, you know, this, this research process really was one of the most difficult that I've had to do. And um, I'm delighted at this point, just that it's over, and I don't have to do it anymore. But I will say one of the things that I loved about this as far as, um, as far as researching was that I did go to Bletchley Park itself. And this was before the lockdown, before the pandemic. And I spent about four or five days there. And Bletchley Park nowadays is an absolutely beautiful visitor center and historic site. Um, I encourage anyone who is making travel plans uh, as the world reopens, you can get to the Bletchley Park uh, area, Milton Keynes. And it's only about an hour outside of London between Oxford and Cambridge. Absolutely go, because not only is it a beautiful site, but you know they have mocked up you know the mansion and the huts to look the way they would have looked during the 40s. And you walking through those grounds and into those huts where the code breakers worked, it really is like walking back in time. Love it. Oh, I would love to go there right now. <laughs> My goodness, get out of the house. Yeah. So who were some of your favorite real 
life figures that you came across. I know we talked about Alan. Um, any other ones that you then decided to populate the, the novel with? Well, I was really quite thrilled by how many notable people did, you know, cross paths with Bletchley Park at some point during their lives. Oh, yep, there go the dogs. <laughs> you. Um, like, you know, just for example, you know, Alan Turing, of course, was there. He was working on uh, in Hut 8 on German naval ciphers. We had um, uh, Ian, Fle uh, Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, was in and out of Bletchley Park. Uh, he really created James Bond because he thought that intelligence work should be more uh, exciting and glamorous than it was. So I think Bletchley Park had definitely an, an influence on him. Um, one of the people that I really was kind of thrilled to include was that uh, we happened to know that uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, the former Kate Middleton, her grandmother was a Bletchley Park code breaker. So you will see her in the background along with everybody else. And then of course, one of the uh, sort of uh, one degree of separation from Bletchley was a figure I really was quite delighted to put in because history really did hand it to me on a silver platter. And that is the fact that uh, Prince Philip, uh, the late Prince Philip, when he was just uh, very far from being a royal consort, just a young, somewhat threadbare naval lieutenant uh, who was in and out, going out to sea and fighting for his country, his wartime girlfriend was a Bletchley Park translator. And uh, I did end up including him as a character, although I have to say I have felt a little bit like a ghoul given, the la given that his death happened so close to the release. And it, I have felt a little bit like, oh God, you know, this man just died and I'm like, here, buy my book about him. <laughs> so that has felt a little bit strange, I have to admit. Um, he's not, you know, the main character in it, but he does appear in this book. But I love that though, don't you think? I think he probably would have loved that and showing him kind of in, back in his youth and and how he tied into another part of history. I think it's fantastic actually timing. It's kind of a, a bit of a tribute in a way. Well, it was, he had an, he had an interesting life. And, you know, at this stage, you know, as I said, he was a royal cousin. He was not anybody particularly important. Uh, Princess Elizabeth herself was, you know, just, you know, very, very young. You know, no one was thinking yet about who she would marry. And as far as who he was, I mean, he was just a, you know, as I said, a young naval lieutenant who's uh, more, who was more interested in proving his loyalty and fighting for his country. Because at this stage, he got a lot of side eye because a lot of his family his sisters had all stayed on the European side. They all married Nazis. And he was getting a lot of, you know, side eye from people who questioned his loyalty. So his biggest priority was he wanted to fight for the country that he had chosen and prove that he did not share uh, his family's sympathies. Absolutely. So with the research, I got to say, I remember the one thing I absolutely loved, um, I remember right from the get-go of your, of your book was the British slang. Some of it I had never heard before. And I thought, I know Kate, I found some of these new this time I'm going, oh, I'm using that. That's a good one. So how did you find some of those? Um, I, I love British slang and I especially love, there's a, there's a kind of slang that existed among sort of the upper crusty types in the thirties and forties that is practically a language of its own and is you know just splendid so i honestly rated uh, a lot of de stevenson novels and pg woodhouse uh for you know interesting slang because th those books are just you know well as oslo would say they're absolutely topping and they are you know just so delightful in terms of you know the kind of the way people talked and it's so fresh and inventive to our modern ears yeah. So I really did enjoy that. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So what were a couple of the, Topping was the one that I remember the most because I thought, oh, that's so cute. I love that. And um, I, my grandpa used to use tip top, you know, in his World War II letters. So it reminded me of that, the American side. So do you remember any other ones that were your favorites? Oh, things like, um, there, what was it? One of the other ones that was, it's like, uh, there were, there are a lot of, a lot of fun words for, you know, being, for, for being drunk or tipsy. You know, like, and so I used a bunch of those and I literally have a list of slang somewhere, which yeah. I wish, you know, I'm going to pull that up because that's the fun part about being on your laptop at the same time. Right. I am absolutely going to pull that up because that is, if I, see if I can. I remember they were <laughs> so cute. And in the meantime, I'll say that, yeah, Catherine Hardy here says that, yes, she absolutely thinks that your book was a tribute to Prince Philip. So that was nice. Um, and that other people, yeah, are looking forward to reading Rose Code and all that, so. <sighs> yes, okay, here's my slang file. Oh, good. My slang file has, oh, for drunk, um, kippered, fizzy, bottled, sauced, 
you uh, get the swithers, which means you're getting in a tizzy. To criticize someone that you crab on. Um, you can be pipped means exhausted yet giddy. Like I'm thoroughly pipped, darling. Um, when you're teasing someone, you're chaffing, faff, no faffing about, uh, bamming, ragging, um, chuffed. I'm utterly chuffed. That means you're pepped up. Take a dead set at to make a play for, like Osla takes a dead set at Prince Philip when he's you know not associated with Elizabeth yet. Uh, throw a spanner in the works. That means ruin a plan. Novel is the same thing. Oh, that's totally novelled now. Snaffled, ditto. Uh, falling apart, you cropped up. A bit of bobbery, silliness. Um, I could go on. This is literally like a three-page list. <laughs> that, you, you three pages, but, yeah, <laughs> that is fantastic. I love it. So you guys, now you look for them as you're all reading the book. <laughs> um, I remember, yeah, Kippered was one of my favorites. So, Oh, utterly Kippered, darling. And I wish I was Kippered like with a mimosa right now, but I kind of thought right, uh, right. coffee would be a better idea. I know. And Kate had stiff. She goes, maybe we should drink mimosas during this because that's often what we do down in San Diego, sit on the on the balcony with the other, other author friends and drink our mimosas because that's the, the one time we get quiet away from the computer and family um, and I thought I'm supposed to write today because we're west coast and uh yeah so I thought I, I'm gonna be done for the day if we do this so, we'll <laughs> um, so about process I you know this is something we've done other panels together and I thought when I thought about doing this today I thought you know I don't know your process actually as far as are you are you are you have to be somewhat of a plotter with historical fiction I'm guessing well, I tend to think that, um, I think everybody does have to be a bit, you know, if you're writing historical. I tend to think of the historical facts as uh, sort of like the skeleton or the framework that you have to work with. And, um, you know, uh, just to use, you know, the Frankenstein metaphor, it's sort of like if you're, if you're using it, the historical facts as the bones. Um, it, history never gives you a complete skeleton because history never gives you all the facts. So therefore you might have, when you're looking at your, uh, what you have to start with, with your historical facts, you basically, if you're in the 20th century, you might have almost a complete skeleton, but you're missing some ribs some fingers some toes here and there. If you're writing further back in time, you may uh, only have, you know, like part of a skull and, you know, some spine and that's all. Uh, so depending on how much history has left you to work with, you'll have to fill in some gaps. And then when you have the, when you have, you know, the, once you have that in place, then you're layering on your fictional uh, people, your fictional parts of your plot and putting that up. And then after that, you are, you know, hopefully you've galvanized the whole thing with a lot of electricity and the book, you know, staggers off the table, moaning into bookshelves and bookstores and onto people's Kindles and hopefully doesn't eat anybody. But yeah, <laughs> that's more or less how I think of it. I do, uh, I, I'm more of a plotter and I tend to be more of a plotter uh, the more further I get in this career, just because I am, I tend to write long and books just get longer and longer. And I would really, I've been trying to plot more so that I don't end up with a book that's over 200,000 words. And then I have to cut, you know, 60,000 words before, uh, if, unless I want to kill my poor editor. So I'm trying to plot more if just to stop myself from needlessly writing 60,000 words that need to be cut. <laughs> right, absolutely. And then, so did you have any surprises then, um, since obviously I know, even if we plot, we have surprises along the way. So surprises with research, something that really like stood out to you, if you remember, or, and or surprise that jumped out at you for the story that you never saw coming, or you thought was going to go a different way? Well, uh, with this book, it was a little bit uh, surprising me all along in some ways, because, you know, for my last two books, for The Alice Network and for The Huntress, I actually... Uh, went back and forth between the timelines as I was writing. You know, I found it was easier to, you know, tease out the parallels that were happening across both timelines. And for this book, um, I wrote all of the wartime timeline first because I wasn't entirely sure what was going to happen in the other timeline, which is post-war. And that takes place in 1947. And that is about when, you know, the three women who worked at Bletchley Park are in some sense uh, pulled back together by an encrypted letter that arrives in the mail and warns them of a traitor from their Bledgley Park years who have yet to be unmasked. And this all happens against the backdrop of the run-up to the royal wedding in uh, 1947 of Philip and Elizabeth. So I wasn't sure what was happening then yet. So I wrote all the wartime stuff first and then I came over and then I said, I still don't know what is happening in the post-war story. So I had to figure that out. And then, you know, once I did, then it, it it changed a lot of stuff in the wartime years as well. So um, I don't recommend doing it this way. I think I prefer to know what's happening before I actually get there and then 
uh, you can realize I'm throwing my hands in the air, but this book was a little bit on the tricky side and it didn't uh, share all its secrets with me at the beginning. <laughs> And then what about favorite characters? You know, you was always like picking your favorite child, right? At least I'm going to ask you what your favorite book is that you've written. I always say that question. The answer always when you're doing a bookstore event is whatever is now on sale. <laughs> it is it is the latest book always. Um, so what, what yep. about your, right? What is your favorite, um, any of your favorite characters that were fictional that come to mind? Um, I really enjoyed writing um, Beth, who is one of my three heroines and who is a crypt analyst and who is of my three, she's got the most brilliant brain when it comes to, you know, being able to see patterns and being able to crack codes. And I am, I do not have that kind of brain. I do, I would not have done the kind of work that Beth did, but I have tremendous admiration for people who do. So it was fun to write her stuff because, you know, it was living vicariously in a way through her and being able to see, you know, feel myself at least for a little bit that like, oh, I, I can at least understand what it would have felt like to literally be in a room on a binge, you know, breaking, you know, and you know, the Italian naval battle plan two days before they're going to launch the attack and to be like running through the night, you know, to the, to the mansion so they can telephone the Admiralty and tell them, yes, we've got the plan and to know that you have changed history. And that is an actual scene in the book. And I loved writing it and it was, you know, great fun to sort of um, get a peek into, at least, you know, fictionally speaking, into what it would be like to have that kind of brain. Yeah, absolutely. And if you were to write then another book that had one of these characters in it, would it be Beth then? Or is there somebody else that comes to mind that you thought, you know, I could actually, they, they could populate, like they could star in their own book if I wrote another one. You know, I don't know. I kind of, I did this book with the idea that, you know, the story is finished. And, um, but you know, you know, never say never. And I do tend to like to do cameo slash Easter egg appearances from my books to cross over. Um, this book has a, has a cameo appearance from uh, my hero from The Huntress. And The Huntress has a cameo appearance from my heroine from The Ellis Network. So maybe one of these ladies will uh, pop up in another book someday as a cameo, or who knows, maybe they'll tell me they need another entire volume. I, I, I really have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I'm gonna. I have a couple more questions, but um, just want to remind people that are watching. Thank you for the sweet comments for both of us that are that are here. And I'll tell Kate if she doesn't know yet. I just learned on my last Zoom that it is possible to save the chat. I had no idea, and so cool. So because there's always things that go by, and you go, "Oh, I wish I could have read that." So anyway, so we'll we'll make sure and get that to Kate when this is all over. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and just type them in, and I will see them, and we'll we'll add them in as well. I think there is. Um, oh, I see. There's another spot for. Um, Oh, there's another spot for Q and A here. I didn't see that one before. Okay, so actually, I'll ask you these before I ask you some of mine. Um, so Catherine wants to know: Was Osla's relationship with Prince Philip factual? So we touched on that. And how did you know about that? By the way, how did you learn about that? Um, well, when I was reading about the women of Bletchley Park, <clears throat> the real Osla, whose name was Osla Benning, uh, turned up quite a bit in people's memories. Generally speaking because she was such a charmer. She was so, um, she seemed to be one of those women that everybody adored. And because, you know, generally speaking, there was, there was always some reminisce of, that began something like, oh, Osla, I loved her. And boy, did she get me in trouble with that prank of hers. And there was, so it seemed like that she was somebody, first of all, who was, you know, prominent in a lot of memories. And then, you know, it popped up from there that someone or other said that, they had observed she was wearing like a little jeweled uh, insignia, which is the kind of thing that, you know, naval off that, you know, military officers would give their girlfriends or their fiancés, like, and they could wear as a brooch, like on your uh, shirt or on your handbag. And they asked her, well, who's your, that's what, naval lieutenant? And she said, yes, I, I'm, that's my boyfriend. And his name's Philip. And they said, well, Philip what? And she said, well, um, he doesn't really have a last name. He's Prince Philip of Greece. And I just thought, that is hilarious. And even, I learned more about it. And then I decided, okay, this is too good not to include in the book. So I did fictionalize my character, Osla, a little bit because um, I kind of felt like it was more respectful. She was a private citizen and, you know, she is dead now, but her children or not. And I did kind of want to say, okay, um, my version does uh, stick in the broad strokes close to the real Osla's life. You know, she was this Canadian born debutante who had learned German at finishing school. She, um, you know, smuggled her way back to England after being sent to Montreal for safety because she said, you know, bugger safety, I'm going to fight for my country. 
Um, she, you know, worked at an airplane factory building airplanes, uh, basically to prove, you know, Debs can get their hands dirty. She was recruited to Bletchley for her German, and she met Philip and being introduced by a friend, and they dated all through the war. Uh, so all of that is real. That was the real um, Osla's uh, that did happen to the real Osla. It happens to my Osla as well. But I gave my Osla a slightly different last name and some different, some various other small differences, you know, basically to just uh, to show that she's my version and not intended to be, you know, this is, I'm writing about your grandmother. Um, Philip is a little bit different. I did not fictionalize him, obviously, but he is a public figure, which means, you know, it's his life to some degree is public property. Um, did I feel that? gave me the right to you know take a hatchet to his uh, reputation or character no i did try to be as respectful of his uh, biography and of his personality as much as i could figure out and to be you know respectful of you know trying to portray him honestly but fairly so that's but it is a real relationship oslin benning does have a wikipedia page and you can look her up and she was absolutely stunning and an absolute um, joy to be around, uh, it seems, from everyone who ever said anything about her in their memoirs. Awesome. So there's another question here that has to do with somebody that's also in the book um, that says, let's get, um, oh, Julie's typed this in from some from Facebook, from Denise, who said, uh, did you write Beth as someone with autism or as you say in the author's notes, neurodivergence? That is something that I've kept in mind because there was definitely a level of acceptance for neurodivergent folks at Bletchley Park. Um, and it, would, it was not a term they would have used, of course. It was just that they would have said, oh, some folks were just a little bit odd. And it was one of the things I actually really admired about Bletchley Park was that there was a real acceptance for people who were not neurotypical because they were smart enough to know that um, it was, you, they had a job to do. And if you could do the job, it didn't matter if you were in the parlance of the times, maybe a little strange. So they did not have a requirement, you know, or like a corporate bottom line that required round pegs to, you know, square pegs to fit into round holes. It was basically, if you could do the job, then we don't care how you do it. And we don't care that maybe you might be considered a little bit socially strange, which is probably more the term they would have used. So, uh, it's, I mean, it's pretty much considered that Alan Turing was probably um, is probably uh, neurodivergent uh, on the spectrum, they might have said. I was thinking that Beth, you know, it's a little bit in a gray area because you know, there was not an understanding of, you know, neurodivergent behavior or uh, being on the spectrum. So she might be someone who is just simply seen as socially shy, or maybe she does, she would be uh, considered on the spectrum today. But it's sort of where I kind of considered that I didn't want to say firmly one way or the other because she would not have said that and she would not have had a concept of it. But I did have a sensitivity reader who was a, a special ed teacher who did help me look at look over that and said that she thought that if she was working with Beth today that maybe she could be considered as on the spectrum. So it sort of turned out that way and I think it occupies a little bit of a gray zone which I'm happy to have it be because you know when you're looking when you're trying to apply modern terms to uh, people in the past who would not have had those terms it's a little bit of a gray area anyway. Absolutely yeah because their understanding of course right as you said is so different back then too so you want to be also accurate in what they would think and what they would what they would call things at the time. Um, so one of the readers, hi Corinne, um, is asking do you have any favorite stories of the women at Bletchley Park that didn't make it into the book? Oh, that's that's a fun one. It is a good one. Um, I would have liked to, yeah, I would have liked to include a little bit more about like uh, the Bledgley Park at theatricals because those are rather famous. Uh, they apparently put on a Christmas review every year. They did performances of Shakespeare. Uh, that would have been fun to include. I didn't quite have the, um, I didn't quite have the uh, room for that, which would have been fun. I would have liked to include more with. Um, there were some pranks that are just mentioned, which uh, like there was a fun one where. It was in which Oslo was involved where they put one of the girls into a laundry basket on wheels and sent it down a hallway and it crashed into the gentleman's loo which had a swinging door and there were men inside who were absolutely horrified and all the ladies got in trouble for that but uh, were totally unrepentant about it <laughs> and it was one of those things that you know I thought that I got had a chance to mention it but I couldn't really depict it in the scene so there's all kinds of hijinks that went on at the park that I really enjoyed um, I would have liked to do more of them <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, that would have been fun, but I didn't have room for everything, unfortunately. Yeah, your editor's like, thank you, Kate. Thank you for not putting all of that in. <laughs> Uh, so Barbara Abbott, uh, let's see here, that just scrolled up, um, from Facebook had asked, is Harry based on a real person? Uh, Harry is, yes. I put him as a fictionalized uh, codebreaker who works on German naval ciphers with Alan Turing, actually. And, um, oh dear, a FedEx truck pulled up outside. Be prepared for uh, dogs going crazy. Okay. Um, it is, but it's one of those things where Harry is based on a real person. In part, he's based on... You know, some of the real code breakers who were working on the uh, on the naval ciphers and they had a terrible lockout in I think it was, was it 1943 and they you know were just about going insane because they couldn't you know get in for about nine months and that was a terrible lockout from the codes but I also put him in uh, because you know he is based on Keith Beatty who was a real code breaker who has this wonderful romance with one of the smartest of the women who was on uh, Dilly Knox's team and he was loaned over from his hut to hers to work on some ciphers when they were slammed. And, you know, they literally fell in love over the code breaking over. And I just thought that was such a great story. I wanted to borrow it from one of my ladies. And so I did. Um, it, but the real Keith Beatty also had something too, where he illustrated something that I really found very poignant about the Bletchley Park men, which is the level of uh, shame that a lot of them felt for not being able to fight physically. And, you know, we can say absolutely, well, a mental fight is every bit as, you know, meaningful as, you know, carrying a gun. You know, one is not more honorable than the other, but the trouble with the men was that, you know, they were under this oath of secrecy not to talk about their war work. And a lot of them would, you know, they'd be breaking codes all day and then they would go home and they would be getting this, you know, shaming from their neighbors, from some, sometimes their own families, you know, like you're a young man, why aren't you in uniform? You should be ashamed of yourself and they can't defend themselves. And so Harry goes through this as, you know, some, a man who's, you know, get, getting a lot of hell for it. And, you know, he's trying to find a solution to that because once you were at Bletchley Park, you were never gonna be allowed to enlist because the, the secret had to be kept. And it was seen that you were not gonna be able to you know, be put in any situation where you might be a POW and forced to give up what you knew. Right. So that's one of the men I based Harry on. And then he's also based on another man who I found who's, who was um, named Morris uh, Zarb, who was from an Egyptian Arabic uh, Maltese background and this very, very highly connected London banking family. And uh, I was I was delighted to find that because, you know, let's be honest, Bletchley Park is a pretty white place. <laughs> And I really wanted to see, you know, you know, I want to find when there are people of color in history, I want to do justice to the fact to showing that they are there so that I'm not totally portraying the world as a hundred percent white place. Now, Bletchley Park was pretty white, but on the other hand, there were, this was very much based on university connections and people were recruited through the school ties. So you did have some folks like Mr. Zarb, who was a you know, definitely who was a man who was not white and who was working at Bletchley Park because of his university connections. And so I have Harry, who I made a cousin of Morris Zarb, and I had him show up there as well, just in some parts so that I can show that, you know, not all the people who worked at Bletchley Park, you know, were white. There were people who were not and who, what would their difficulties have been, you know, because there is certainly prejudice during this era and it would be uh, disingenuous not to show that. So yes, a bit of a long answer, but Harry is a composite of these two uh, real men who I found in my research and I sort of like fictionalized them into one guy so that I would have an interesting hero uh, to have on the page. And then speaking of the men at Bletchley Park too, there's a question from Maria who said, um, what happened to Alan Turing? And this is a really good question. Did any of the workers that you're aware of feel unsafe after the war due to what they knew? Um, I don't think they did feel unsafe because for the most part, it was just, you know, Bletchley Park shut down and everybody was just told, okay, go home, don't talk about it. And they did. <laughs> they took their oath very seriously. Um, I don't think, and you know, after the war, it wasn't so, uh, it wasn't quite so urgent about the secrecy because, you know, it was no longer, we need to keep this secret because we don't win the war without reading, without uh, the fact that we're reading the enemy's mail. Um, as far as what happened to Alan Turing, you know, that's really one of the tragic, uh, one of the very tragic things that happened. Um, 
he was homosexual and he was uh, essentially persecuted for that because uh, he was arrested. It came out uh, because of an encounter of his and he was uh, essentially had forced to make the choice between what they called chemical castration or prison. And he chose chemical castration and it was, it's really an absolutely horrendous miscarriage of justice after the war. And he uh, is very likely committed suicide um, by biting a poisoned apple. Um, it was cyanide poisoning. And it was, it's very likely suicide uh, because of what happened to him. And the British government actually, you know, decades after the fact, of course, issued a formal apology for what happened to really an incredibly brilliant man whose work on, you know, artificial intelligence and on the computing, uh, the, the budding computer era, you know, uh, the Turing test is something that stands today as a measure by which we can measure uh, AI, artificial intelligence. And there is a whole display at Bletchley Park now devoted to Alan Turing. You will see, you can see the letter from the prime minister, which is an official apology to at least his memory. So long overdue of course but you know i'm glad at least it i'm glad at least it happened Absolutely. but yeah that's one of the sadder stories and um really a ter really a terrible one because he was a brilliant man and there is so much more he could have done if he'd been allowed to be the man that he was and not be persecuted right and how much more he would have created and invented if he could i know it's it's terrible life. yeah um and so we've got a question here from dory um so I'm going to be careful around this question. She's asking some great questions, but I'm going to be careful of the spoilers because not everybody's read the book and assumingly. Um, so she asked some, some dramatic things, exciting things happen at the end of the book that which is where I couldn't put it down because we have to know what happens here. Um, I know you know what I'm talking about. And there's also we know from the very beginning, right, that there's there's possibly a traitor involved somewhere. Um, so with those two things in mind, um, how much of that they want to know was uh, what she wants to know is fact or fiction. Um, there actually was a traitor at Bletchley Park. Um, I'm not going to mention who my traitor is because I don't want to spoil it for you. But historically, historically speaking, yes, there was a Russian mole who worked at Bletchley Park. And that may sound incredible, but it is true. And um, that person said that literally they were able to sneak out, you know, little slips of paper, you know, in your sleeve or whatever, and they passed information to the Russians. The, re, um, the real Russian mole, his name was John Cairncross. He was not discovered until I think the 50s or 60s, I can't remember, um, when basically an entire ring of Russian moles were uncovered at the highest level of the British government in the foreign office, in the diplomatic levels, in the, what was the other, in, you know, MI5, MI6. Um, they were known as the Cambridge Five, and they had all been introduced, they'd been recruited during their university years. The man Cairncross, who worked at Bletchley Park, he was adamant that he was, you know, not a so he was not a communist. He was not a, you know, Russian sympathizer. What he was was completely devoted to defeating fascism and Hitler. And he said, "I passed information to the Russians during the war from Bletchley because they were our ally, and they were we were not sharing enough information with them. And if we didn't share more with them." they wouldn't be able to defeat Hitler and we would not win this war. So that's why I did it. And I never shared anything after the war. You can believe that or not. And I think it's, it's a little, uh, it's a little dicey, but yes, there was a real, uh, there was a real uh, mole at Bletchley Park. And once I knew that, because I was just, I thought, well, I'm going to base my uh, Russian mole a bit on uh, that man. Although I will not give any identity clues about who they might be in this book. So as not to spoil it. Um, there's also the fact that I see the I see part of the question is that someone in this book is and you'll see this at the beginning locked away in an asylum. That is very true. I found uh, in my research record of a woman who had been locked in an asylum and she was a Bletchley Park code breaker who had an emo had a, a, some kind of nervous breakdown after an affair that she was having with a married colleague at the park went south. And she was uh, had such a had such a bad breakdown emotionally that they were worried she would disclose uh, classified information in her upset state. So she was literally sentenced to an institution, at least for a time, to make sure that she would not compromise the safety of the park. I was not able to find out what this woman's name was or when she was released. I really hope she was. But I, as soon as I read that, I thought, wow, that is something 
not only does that tell you how seriously they took the security around the park at this time, but that is horrendously open to abuse. Mm -hmm. And I could easily see how a woman could literally just be thrown away and disappear into that kind of institution. And so that's what I fictionalized with one of the characters. And I even did fictionalize the fact that, you know, it's allegedly her affair with a married colleague that is the thing that they blame an emotional breakdown on. And I thought, but mm, is that really the story or is that a cover story that somebody uses to get rid of a woman who knows too much? And that's a, there, I, I, I managed to duck around uh, all the plots. Hey, <laughs> So Julie's going to pop in here for a second, uh, back in, but I have to get this in TV film option news because everybody, they always want to know this stuff. And that is always the book club question, right? And you do have an answer for that. Uh, yes. Uh, this book has been optioned as a limited series, but that is all I know. Like that is literally the only news we have so far. So there is no, um, there's no casting news. Uh, the only other thing I think is very cool is that, the production company is the same production company that produced the imitation game. Ooh. So I am like, oh, yes, you yeah. people obviously know your Bletchley Park. I am thrilled. So, um, but in any case, uh, it's not a guarantee, an option. Uh, it's just the step, first step on a very long, you know, path in Hollywood. So it's not a guarantee that this means you're absolutely going to see this on your screens. Um, I think Diana Gabaldon once said that like she sold the option for Outlander something like four or five times and it always came to nothing and then finally stars bought it and then it became the juggernaut that it is today so that's just to show you that like it's not a guarantee that it's absolutely going to happen but fingers crossed so fun it's so exciting it's an exciting milestone that we'll all celebrate we'll have mimosas over that and and i'm um, just so you all know too the rose code hit the new york times list immediately it's just selling like crazy so again if you haven't got a copy yet get it from warwick's today so yeah. Oh, with you, Julie. Okay. And, uh, well, I've got some questions for you too, Christina. So there's, um, oh, boy, there's lots of good stuff going on on Facebook. So afterwards, Kate, if you get, you know, great comments going on. So love everybody that's here today with us. So um, um, Arlene on Facebook has a question for both of you, both of you. So Christina, I'll start with you on this one. Um, so, and I'm going to combine her first two parts of this question. She has some writerly questions and I know everybody loves all those uh, behind the scenes kind of questions. Yeah. Um, so she's asking, how did you get your agent and what's their primary role in your writing career? And do you get to choose your editor? Oh, goodness. Okay, let's see here. So we'll do, you might have to, remember it's right. more in here. So you're gonna have to, we'll walk through. Okay, so right. um, let's see here. So how I got my agent, um, probably similar to Kate in that, well, um, I have a file folder full of, for my first agent anyway, I've had a couple um, because you know it's been years of writing and many books. Um, and so I have a file folder. I don't know about Kate, but at, at least 60 rejections um, that I kept proudly. Uh, and so it's, and some recently I had go through, I think about a year or so ago when I did some presentation about, you know, getting agents and queries and that sort of thing. And, and I'm, I'm super proud of it. You know, my kids know I have it because every time I got a rejection, I would send out two more submissions on the very same day. So I always had twice as much hope than disappointment. And I thought that it's just, an, I thought as long as I keep improving my craft in the meantime, keep improving the draft while I'm waiting for that, yes, send me more. It was snail mail back then. So it was just excruciating, right, Kate? The self address yeah. stamped envelope <laughs> that I would go to the mailbox every day to go find. Um, yeah, so that's how it came about for my, my first agent. And most of my rejections actually you know, as my craft improved um, at the time with my first book, Letters from Home, which was World War II, um, were, this is funny, Kate and I will laugh about this now, <laughs> half of them were, when it was nicer, love the characters, love the premise, all, nice, good things, except World War II will never sell. <laughs> <laughs> I so know, Kate, people don't believe that now that like, it, not that long ago, literally, you couldn't get anybody to pick up a World War II novel. Nope. They're yep. crazy. They tell you, they're like, just be, you know, because it won't sell. And you're like, well, and that's when I learned nothing sells until it sells. And now, right now, my, so Kate, you should know that World War II doesn't sell. So you might want to rethink this whole direction that you're going. I'm just oh, saying. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So what else? We got agent, um, edit, uh, editor was the third question. Um, so editor is having an agent. Yes. That um, got passionate about, you know, my books and, and then submits it um, to different houses and they have an acquisitions editor. And so right. that editor then 
if they love it, they fight for it and it goes to a war room. And when you realize all the back room stuff, right, that happens in the steps, you just go, how does any book ever get sold? Oh. Like you think we hit the lottery, you it's know? It's so like, true because, and I think that that's the thing that, that I think what people need to understand is that when the publishing house, it's an editor who buys the book is that's who the agent sends it out to all the houses and the editor is actually who buys the book. So you do have a little bit of choosing who, if you're, if you have multiple people asking for your book, that's where your choice of, of that quote editor choice comes in, correct? Absolutely, yes. And you hope that they didn't read a book just like yours the day before, or that if yours is right. a love story that they didn't just have a major breakup the day before. Right. And last thing want to read is a love story. So, so, so much of it, just like a reader's experience with any book, I'm sure we all agree with this. Half of it has nothing to do with us. You know, yeah. we kind of give that skeleton and, and they fill in a lot of their own feelings, um, which is how we all have different experiences with the exact same books. And right. which makes it amazing, actually. Um, and so, oh, go ahead, Kate. It's also one of those things too, where um, one of the great ways when you have an agent is that your agent knows editors. Agent, agents know editors, they know each other. They know, um, they know, and it's not just a matter of like, that means that your book might go higher in the pile that the editor gets because, but it also means the agent knows who at a particular publishing house likes the kind of thing that you're selling. Right. And so that way it's like, you know, I know that my agent, you know, like, my agent would ab can absolutely, if she's selling to Morrow, which is my house, she can say, you know, Tessa Woodward at Morrow absolutely loves war stories and women-centric stories. This is a Tessa Woodward book. And they send it to her rather than maybe one of the other editors there who is more inclined to be the person you would approach with say sci-fi or a thriller. Right. You know, so ideally speaking, your agent will help you find the editor that's right for you because they know who to submit to, who likes and who likes what. Yeah, they're a matchmaker. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. for sure. Matchmaker, like keep going, oh, you would love so-and-so. You guys right. need to go on a date. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, Arlene's got a lot of parts of this question, Arlene. I'm probably not going to be able to get to all of them because we've got lots of other questions yeah, yeah. coming in. Um, but the one that I will, um, for the second part is for, and Kate, we'll start with you on this one and then we'll go to Christina. In your most recent published book, what was the most challenging revision you had to make and how did you think it improved your book? Oh goodness. Um, with this one, it, the most challenging revision was probably, oh, I originally had like three timelines rather than two. And I realized it was way too inception and complicated. And so I uh, compressed two of the timelines into one and uh, it was a much better fix all the way around. Um, I have had, a, not with this book, it was with The Huntress though. The most, the most critical thing that I had to change was Literally all my critique partners told me a third of your book is not working. One of your uh, narrators just um, is just terrible and we don't like him at all. And I'm like, okay, okay. I need to completely rethink an entire viewpoint, which wow. is one third of this novel and I have six weeks to do it. And I did. And by the end they liked him, they all adored him. So it worked, but that was really, that was really difficult. I have to. Boy, agree. those are good critique partners that they're able to be that honest with you. Yeah. yeah, and it, it's not fun to hear, but you know, it's like I had to hear it, and I'm glad I did. So yeah, yeah, and then you can't unhear it, right? Because like <laughs> whatever, I, he's fine, and you're like, oh, all right, no, maybe. no, maybe they're right. <laughs> this is why, like, 24 hours, 48 is better before you react to any feedback that you get, because your initial reaction is you are completely wrong. <laughs> you just didn't understand what I was trying to do there. You you totally didn't get it, and then you sit back and you're like, maybe they're oh. right. Yeah, right. Damn it, they're right. Oh, damn it, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> this is why you don't react immediately because that first reaction is never a nice one. <laughs> right, right. Christina, yeah. how about you? Did Was there something that you had to rip out and how did it help or change? So what happened was it was additions. So that's the thing, right? I write probably shorter and Kate writes long. So hers is usually probably chopping. Mine's like, okay, you got to add some more to it. Um, <laughs> the, the only one really for me with like sold on a Monday, the last book was- um, Which is coming in on a million copies sold. Can we get a, some pop bombs for that? Excuse me. <laughs> Kate knows how that feels because she sold millions of copies. Um, so was sold on a Monday. When I went out to, um, I was changing agents at the time because my last, the agent I adored before that was left the industry. And mm. so I'm like, no, she, I thought she's going to be my forever agent, you know, and, and then, I mean, it was just, and I'm still friends with her. She's wonderful. And she's cheering me on, which is amazing. And, um, new agent then Elizabeth weed, um, 
uh, you know, she ended up being my dream agent and I can't believe I'm with her. We are, we're just like, we're such a good fit. And um, what happened was I had, um, I had sold on a Monday, the beginning of the book written, I submitted to agents. I had, I was lucky enough to have several offers. Uh, Elizabeth was the only one who said, the other all said, this is great. We would sub it like this, you know, would just add more pages, but otherwise we're happy. And she was the only one who said, it was all male point of view. And mm -hmm. I'd done it before with the edge of lost, um, which, you know, is not as usual, but I love it. And, um, and like water for elephants is written the same way. Um, and so she was the only one who said, you know, what? I really think though, you need a female point of view here. I had a female character, but not her point of view. I thought, I don't want to do so. I did the whole, mm, no, like, uh, it's like, it's fine the way it is. All these, you know, five other agents said it's totally fine. What is she talking about? What does she know? And, yeah. So luckily my husband, I think, and my good friend, Therese Walsh said, um, Chris, you might want to just, just for fun as an exercise, who would you add as a point of view? And I'm like, well, there is a female character and she's major and she has lots of thoughts and you'll never hear them. Okay. So yes, I ended up putting that in and yeah. And that ended up being a good thing. I think a lot of uh, book clubs have said that's their favorite character and having a female, of course, in the 1930s in a in working in the newspaper industry. So in an industry that's so male dominated, um, you know, like so many things that we write about, it was fun to have a woman, um, her point of view there. So it added right, a lot right. to the story. It was good. <laughs> good suggestion. Um, and we're going to run out of time, but I'm going to get to as many. And there's a lot of questions asking about what comes next. So we'll get that at the very end. Um, so quick question, um, another from Facebook is, and I'll start with you, Kate, on this one. Do you get, and this is from Dory, do you get, oops, it scrolled a little bit. Do you get the final choice on the title of your book? Um, that's a good one. I, I'm terrible at titles. So uh, quite often, you know, somebody else comes up with it and I'm like, oh, that's good. Let's go with that. Um, I did have the Rose Code in place relatively early. And that is, and that was really nice because, you know, the, as I think, uh, Chris, I'm willing to bet you've had this happen too. But if you have a book that goes through with a placeholder title, then you end up, sometimes you end up with a title and then you, you're like, I now have to weave that thematically through the book. And I have no idea. And then you're like, you know, how can I jam snake in a dream into this book? Just because now I have a snake in the title, you know? So it's like, that can be a little bit uh, difficult, but so it's, so this one had the rose code in place more relatively early on in the process, which is great because then I was like, okay, I can get all like deep and thematic and shit with roses through the entire draft. And uh, that's a lot easier to do from the start than when you're frantically trying to jam roses into the scene, whether they fit there or not. <laughs> And with mine, it was just abs some some books have letters from home was always the title, um, and then you know became other titles. And then the, my when I sold it, the editor said, "Well, actually, we re do you have anything else?" And I said, "Well, it was letters from home. They're like we love it." And so sometimes they circle back through. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. I've made a, a title that um, for the pieces we keep, it was like Nazi spies, World War II story. Um, that one was I was the pieces we keep. My editor said, "Do you have anything else?" I said, how about the edge of lost? He came back and said, mm, no, we still, we like the pieces we keep better. I'm like, great, but now I have this title. I'm like, it's a really good title. <laughs> Fitting the next book better. So, you know, you kind of, sometimes you kind of go, I think I could recycle it. And actually it was such a good fit, you know? So yeah, so sometimes there's, that happens. <laughs> there's a game you can play like with all of your friends where you start doing word salad. You come up with like all the words that thematically matter in the book. And then you start throwing them together in like any combination you can terrible combinations <laughs> terrible combinations ideally like you throw a bottle of a bottle of wine into this process too yeah. you're you're throwing words together it's total word salad and then you send your editor like a huge list and they invariably come back with the one that you realize you actually don't like oh no <laughs> yes. never give them anything you that don't, you're yeah, warm questionable about, about. yeah and so to really answer that question we do i think for the most part we get kind of a final say mm -hmm. they want us happy too i right. mean it you know, but if they have a, if we're like, uh, and they have a really strong reason for it, I would absolutely, of course, you know, we want the book to sell. So right. that's most important. And titles are important. Just like, I mean, they say, don't judge a book by its cover. Sorry. In the book business, you, you know, when you're walking up by a table with a lots of books, there is that discovery of a book cover. So um, there yeah. is that. Um, and lots of people on the comments and everything, everybody loves your books on book clubs. And I have to give a shout out to Mary Ellen McWhorter. I hope you're still here. She was my daughter's seventh grade 
English teacher who was the best English teacher that any students could want. So she's reading, reading the Rose Code for her book club too. So hello, Mary Ellen. Hey, teachers. <laughs> Gosh, Bye, yay, teachers. And actually my daughter ended up being, becoming a teacher. So you've got all that going on. So I'm going to end this with what everybody wants to know is what are you working on next and what time period? So we're going to start with Christina and then we'll end with Kate and then we'll do some closing stuff. Well, even though World War II never sells, um, <laughs> I decided just to, you know, be the outlier. And uh, so, yes, the new book is called, oh, I'm in the home stretch, by the way. Um, it's called The Ways We Hide. Um, so I don't even know if I told Kate that she's helped me brainstorm a bazillion titles. Um, so it's called The Ways We Hide. And when I can tell more about it, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, all I'll tell you today is that it involves a secret British military intelligence group that when I heard about it, I had no idea it existed. I ran it past Kate, my World War II go-to person. She had never heard of it. I knew that I hit jackpot then. Um, and all I'll say is that it was the secret group that similar to Bletchley Park, everything was kept confidential and classified. Um, they couldn't talk about it. They, they did, they had such an unusual group with such unique talents that, and the way they recruited people that was so different um, that, and so successful in so many ways, they kept it classified until 1985 because they thought they might have to use it against the Russians during the Cold War. So some of the things they used were things you all grew up with. You have them in your homes and you have no idea they used them the way they did. So that's a little sneak peek. Well, and part of the question too was how long did it take between books? Christina, the question for you might be a little different than <laughs> Kate. Well, so my mine, how long for this book has, well, about a year and a half, almost two years now. I was on and off tour with Sold on a Monday. like the For best a long book. time. You remember I circled back good. around you guys. It I'm like, yeah, so I'm tour for the same book. It was, oh, it was about a year on yeah. and off. It was insane. So I never got any writing done. Um, and then, you know, and then the pandemic. So everything's, you know, hardest book, most complex story, right. most research. I mean, this sounds like her rose code. Um, and so it has taken me longer with everybody in my space. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Slowed it down. Um, but I'm, I'm like, I am about, you know, 50 pages away. So so do we, are we thinking 2022 or 2023? Next year. Yeah. 22. Okay. Right so now. Yes. We will yeah. have you come back here. Yes. <laughs> Kate, how about you? What's it got going on? Uh, well, um, you know, it's a similar thing, you know, I, again, you know, World War II is just not selling, but I'm, I'm going to stick, I'm going to stick in there with the next one. Um, the next book is titled The Diamond Eye. And it is about, it's actually a book I've had in my pocket for a while. And um, I'm thrilled thrilled that it's going to be the next one and because it is about a woman who I could not believe was actually real it is about a woman who is the most famous most successful female sniper of all time and this woman was she's uh she was a Russian young woman who was a single mom a aspiring historian a grad student with a deeply deeply dorky dissertation topic who's just, you know, working on her, on her, on her, her small civilian life. And then Hitler invades Russia. And she, because the Russians actually did not have this whole idea that women could not fight in combat. She uh, joined the army. She went off to war. She became a sniper. She wrapped up a tally of 309 enemies. And if that wasn't, uh, that that wasn't interesting enough to make her, um, you know, absolutely fascinating as a, a heroine for a book. She earned the nickname Lady Death, which is one of the most shiver-inducing nicknames of all time, and was sent on a goodwill tour to the United States, where she basically, in 1942, where she basically met everybody who was famous at the time in the U.S. and, you know, just as one does, becomes BFFs with Eleanor Roosevelt. So I'm just thinking like a Russian sniper becoming friends with the first lady. I don't know how I didn't hear about this, but I'm right. going to write it now that I know about it. So like Christina, like this was my, this was kind of my pandemic book. Um, I kind of had two. The Rose Cove was the one I had finished my rough draft um, right before lockdown began. And I had literally all the editing, all the, you know, 19 million rounds of editing happened while I was in lockdown. This was the book that I drafted entirely in lockdown. Mm. And um, I started it. It's also one of the books I've written the fastest. I, I drafted The Diamond Eye in three and a half months flat. Um, starting and I think the reason for that was that I began that writing that book um, in November I or in um, 
October, I think it was, I had done a lot of outlining for it because I don't know about you, Christina, but I had the attention span of a goldfish <laughs> during lockdown and I didn't even have kids who were running in on me, but I still felt like I could not focus on that blank screen and I could not draft, but I could outline and I could research. So I did a lot of outlining with this book in advance. In October, I start writing and then three and a half months flat, 100,000 100, words. And I think the reason for that was that it was, you know, it was fall. It was this horrendous, uh, you know, lockdown numbers for the quarantine was nowhere and in ending in sight. Word salad, Jesus. Um, the, yeah, lockdown was nowhere. The end of it was nowhere in sight. You know, the uh, COVID numbers were terrible. The election was going on. And I think my brain literally was like, you know, I need a break from this world around me and the Russian front just sounds so soothing and calming. And he said, like, let me go dive into the freezing weather and the bullets and the mud and the, you know, this wonderful, balmy, relaxing environment of the World War II Russian front. That sounds great compared to what's going on outside my window. Wow. So like my brain dove into that and escaped and I, turned it out really quickly, which is why you're going to get it really quickly. Uh, this oh. book is going to be scheduled to come out uh, literally March 2022, wow. uh, only a year after Rose Code, because my oh. muse decided she needed a break and the Russian front was it. Love it. But <laughs> not like it's not just like this little bit of a, of a complex story. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're amazing. She's just a machine though. Yep. Like like incredible in the best of ways amazing so speaking of goldfish i can't think of the name of the book but there's this great book that has a goldfish as a um says the protagonist one of the protagonists it's uh, by bradley summer i think i can't think of the name of it but find it kate it's the it's a hilarious book <laughs> i already feel like uh, i like most of the writers i know kind of feel a little bit like dory from finding nemo right. during the pandemic we're all kind of like oh a boat oh right it. it's like yeah. we, none of us could focus on anything no <laughs> And I, as readers, we were the same way. It's like, as a reader, I could not, for those first few months, I was watching, I think I watched Lord of the Rings on repeat for like, <laughs> After Tiger King. <laughs> oh God, exactly. Tiger King. The era of Tiger King. Oh, he's King. over. Oh my God, he's <laughs> over. <laughs> oh my God. I know. We're just like, just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Yeah. yeah. Oh, goodness me. All right, ladies, we have taken up way more of your time. We so appreciate you being here on Independent Bookstore Day with us. Um, Christina, if people want to follow you, do you have a website that leads everybody to social media, I'm assuming? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Just my name, Christina McMorris.com and um, Facebook author page. I'll be, you know, I post more th there probably than anywhere and I will be giving away early copies and all that good stuff. Excellent. Kate, how about you? Yep. You can find me uh, just Kate Quinn author, my Facebook page, uh, Kate Quinn author on Twitter and Kate Quinn 5975 on Instagram. I'm usually, <laughs> I'm usually there, you know procrastinating from my board count so that's, keeps kind of that's, kind that's of like what we do, my yeah. code you get that that whole five nine five seven <laughs> i like it yeah there's a whole story behind that and that i basically just took whatever name that instagram gave oh. me and um, and uh, there now there you have it <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, <coughs> books, were, books were in the chat, but they're somewhere. There was so much chatting going on that they're somewhere buried up there in the chat. So just remember, um, we have signed copies while they last of the Rose Code. You can order online from us. You can order online Christina's books sold on a Monday from us. Um, come by and see us today if you want to listen to a little music and buy some books. Um, appreciate both of you so much. Uh, thank you for being here. And um, when I close this, unfortunately, Christine and Kate, we don't go back into a green room. It kind of just ends it all for us. So thank you again. Um, and so good night, Facebook. Good night, webinar. And good night, YouTube. All right. Bye. Or good night. I should nap, say good day. It's noon. Oh, it, oh it's, it's, night. it's naps. It's nap time. <laughs> all right. Loads of time. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's like, <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Right, bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> good night again. Sorry. <laughs> bye.